I'm so excited. I love to get to preach on this and I get to study and we're switching it up. We're going to uh, jump off of Matthew for a little while and, and, and come to uh, Luke. And this is the final week, the Passion Week. Um, it starts today. And this is really interesting. Let me give you a couple of awesome things. Two-fifths of the Gospel of Matthew is given to this week. Uh, Three-fifths of the Gospel of Mark is given to this week from Palm Sunday to the Resurrection. A third of the Gospel of Luke and half of the Gospel of John. So 89 chapters in, in all the Gospels put together. Four chapters of those 89 are the first 30 years of the life of Jesus. 55 of the chapters are the three and a half years of Jesus' ministry. And 29 of the chapters are given to this week, beginning with Palm Sunday until the resurrection. I'm going to read for you out of the Gospel of Luke. So turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 19. I'm going to begin reading at verse 28. <coughs> After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he has told them. And they were untying the colt. Its owner asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near to the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said, Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. What have we crowned in our life? What have we put a crown on? Is Jesus king? Is Jesus the true king? Is Jesus your king? I was learning. It's so cool to be able to almost anything that you can study or think about, I can put in a sermon. Um, there's a, I was learning this week about something called a memory trace. And I don't know if anybody... No, I didn't know what it was, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, unless you kind of do. When I was learning about what a memory trace is, it's something that you know. It's something you know, but you don't know how you know. So a memory trace is something that you know, but you don't know how you know. But when you see it, you're like, yeah, I, I know that. And it comes up a lot of times in books or in movies, and I think it's something in us, and I'll explain it, because we love, we love great stories where good destroys evil, or there's some kind of heroic self-sacrifice, or people escape death, or you can live forever, or there's victory, but it looks like right at the point of defeat is when the victory happens. A place where love is eternal and there's a true king and a place that is eternal. And a memory trace is when we see that, when we're watching that on a movie, we're like, yes, that's it. Do you, do you get it? Like, we, we, we spend so much money on, you know, superhero movies. I mean, some of the best movies are exactly what this, and we're watching it. When Luke Skywalker is about to kill, you know, about to destroy the Death Star. Or when it looks like Rocky is done. And then all of a sudden you hear the music playing. And you're like, he's getting up! And then victory. Every single kind of story like that. And the memory trace is this. We're like, yes! That's right. And there's a reason that's right. So we're, we're in the Gospel of Luke. But I want us to notice some things about Palm Sunday, and then when, when, we, get, when we get into it, you'll, you'll see. You, you'll, you'll see what I mean. But let's, let me first give a couple little settings before we get into the points. Is that, is that cool? Like a couple little 
Okay, two people. Yeah, I'll, you two, I'll say. Um, right before this, right before this, uh, there's two blind guys. Like, this is right before Jesus is going to enter Jerusalem. There's two blind guys, and they're shouting out, Son of David, Son of David. So what they're crying out is the messianic title for Jesus. But you're the king of kings. You're the Messiah. And Jesus goes over to him. He says, what, what do you want me to do for you? And they said, well, we want to see. And Jesus, in front of everybody, first off, he accepts the title. He doesn't tell them not to say it, which we know he's been doing throughout the ministry because it wasn't his time yet. He accepts the title and he does the miracle in front of a whole bunch of people. And so now the crowd is, is kind of worked up. So Jesus accepts the title and it's called our Savior, our Messiah, the Son of David, right in front of everybody. And then, and I never knew this before. I don't know how I didn't know. It's, it's, in all four Gospels, this entry of Jesus is in them. Jesus planned the entrance. Okay, you're not as surprised as I was. Um, at the, the more I was reading it, so what I did is I just took all of the Gospels and I, and I put them beside each other and kept reading them and reading them. Jesus is actually orchestrating the triumphal entry. And I've always kind of, I don't know, I don't know how I thought about it before. I think I always thought about it that, you know, Jesus is like, he's been telling his disciples, we're on Jerusalem, Jesus knows what's going to happen. But it's like he gets on the donkey and he rides in and the crowds like are freaking out and they're throwing their palm branches and cloaks down. And he's like, and they're shouting, son of David. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, great. You know, no, you didn't think that? Like, you I always kind of thought of it just like that. Like somehow it kind of happened. But if you start to study it, it's like so on purpose that Jesus is in control of every aspect. Uh, first off, he sends the disciples to get this donkey. And they're outside of Jerusalem. And Bethany and Bethpage are really close to each other. And in Bethany is where, does anybody know what miracle happened in Bethany? The big miracle? Lazarus, right? So all the people in this town already saw this great uh, miracle. And he's just accepted the praise of these two blind men, saying, son of David. He's healed Lazarus. And the crowd that's coming isn't already in Jerusalem. There is a, one in Jerusalem, but outside of Jerusalem. So the crowd is going ahead of Jesus. Okay. What I'm saying is, Jesus is planning this very specifically in what he's going to ride on and how he's going to go into town. And then he, <laughs> it's actually a kingship thing. And the disciples, I think at this point, this is before we're getting into the text. I'm just trying to set it up. I think that since the crowd is there and it's all the people that have seen the miracles of Lazarus, seen the blind guys healed, Jesus is saying... Yes, we're going in, and they're like, this is it. This is it, right? So they're getting, they're getting ready. Because they think, just like the people in Jerusalem are thinking, we're going to overthrow Rome. This is it. We've got, you know, usually I think the population in Jerusalem was about 8,000 people in the first century. But on this particular day, there would be over 2 million people in a one square mile area of Jews from all around to celebrate the highest of their worship days. And, and Jesus, they're like, two million of us, we got it, right? We could, we could take over Rome, we've got this. But instead, the disciples are standing there, and I was just trying to put myself in, in like their mindset. And the other two come up, and Jesus is like, and I'm going to ride this baby donkey. It's actually like not even a adult donkey <laughs> I was trying to look up there's all kind of words for like a jack there's like never mind but you're but you're thinking the reason that people ride into and the reason why palm branches and the reason why hosanna is because a victory has happened that's that's what all that is when a military campaign had been won they come back in and the general rides in on his steed 
But Jesus isn't gotten a steed. As a matter of fact, who rides a donkey? Hobbits? I mean, ch- children ride a donkey or servants, but, but not a king. And I could just see the disciples going, okay, we, there's got to be, we need an image consultant because there's got to be a better way that we do this. But Jesus is like, I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. And the third thing is, so Jesus accepts the title. Jesus orchestrates the triumphal entry. He's in control of the whole thing. And then Jesus lets the people praise him. Do you see how huge that is? He's letting the people praise him. Okay. We can't know Jesus. We can't know the true king unless we know him as our king. We, don't, we can't know Jesus unless we know him as king. And he's the true king. So, so listen. In verse 37 it says, When Jesus came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd and disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king, the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Do you know what they're quoting? They're quoting Psalm 118. You got to hear some of Psalm 118. Because once you understand that they are saying Jesus is the king, Jesus is the Messiah. Listen to some more. That's one part of 118. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. And I will not die but live and proclaim what the Lord has done. Open for me the gates of righteousness and I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it in this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Listen, listen, listen. The people are crying out. The Psalm 118, the rest of it. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God and he has made his light shine on us. With branches in hand, join in the festival procession. You are my God. I will praise you. You are my God. I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Isn't it like... I know, right? Like I'm just reading that going. So we take a, a small little part. We take a small little part... And they're saying it, but they're saying it in reference to all of what was said in Psalm 118. They were just saying the conclusion. But it's all about, Hosanna, our God has come to save us. Jesus is actually forcing everyone in Jerusalem, you either crown me now or you're going to have to kill me. He's forcing their hand. You either crown me or kill me because, guess what? Rome isn't going to look too kindly on someone coming in. And the religious leaders are trying to hold on to their power. And they're like, he's going to get us all killed. Some people think, some commentators think, this is when Judas made his decision to betray Jesus. When it looked like it was going to go, that they were, he was going to be part of the people that took over. And then it didn't happen. Jesus is forcing a decision. For us too. You either crown me or kill me. Matthew tells us that the money changers. Okay, just think about him, Jesus going in and clearing the temple. I've already preached on that, so you have to go back and, and find that sermon later. But he says, my house. And then he rearranges all the furniture. Who rearranges furniture in your house? person that owns the house right you don't just come in and re and do you see why they're mad he's saying my house jesus forces them to make a decision and us too and i I think we use the term king and i don't think we think about it i was reading uh this week you know we have no king um when john guest he is 
you've probably, some of you probably heard him. Uh, remember we went to a, a thing years ago um, that he came and preached in, in this area. Um, he's a British minister. And when he first came to the United States, he did a tour of the Philadelphia area, went and saw the Liberty Bell and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And he was um, down in Germantown. And he went to a store where there was a, a lot of old historic Americana. And he was looking through it. And it was things from the Revolutionary War. And there were signs and slogans on all different things. And one of them, he saw the sign, we serve no sovereign here. And he thought, well, that's America. You know, they serve no sovereign. He had to come to grips with, we say, we don't need monarchs. We don't need kings. We don't need anyone to be an authority over us. We have authority in our own lives. And, you know, in a very... I think, great political thing. We have a, a balance of power between things. But think about this. Even though politically we don't have a king, we do. We crown lots of things kings in our lives. We've put a crown on even things that are good above God. I mean, we've done it. We've crowned jobs. We've made kings out of other people. We've made And put a crown on status. C.S. Lewis wrote a, a famous essay. And he says this. Where we are forbidden to honor a king. We will honor millionaires. Athletes. Film stars. And sometimes even gangsters. And then he says. For spiritual nature. Like bodily nature. Will be served. Deny it food. And it will gobble poison. He says, spiritual nature, like physical nature, will be served. Deny it food, it will gobble. What's he saying? I mean, this is remarkable. He's saying something you can tell yourself you don't need a king, but you know you do. You know you're going to bow down and to serve something. There is something that is going to get the crown. But what does that mean for us spiritually? How does it look? What do we think of? We were, we were designed to serve The perfect king. If you want to live for something, you have to live for something. There's got to be some meaning. Do you see the, do you see even me saying that, the memory trace idea? Yes, we all bow the knee and serve something. We were designed to serve the true king, God. But whatever we think makes our life significant, is the thing that we usually crown. There has to be something, so we put a crown on it. Because I want to accomplish this, I'm going to put a crown on it. Or because I want to be in this, I'm going to put a crown on it. Even if we want to feel like I'm a good person or have some value, there's something that we're serving. And it's in control of us. It's the thing that has authority over us. It's the king in our life. If you're, if you're living for your career, and that's how I know I'm successful, you've crowned it. And then the career is going to be the thing that drives you. It's in control of you. If something goes wrong, if something happens, if the job is lost, what's going to happen? It'll punish us. It'll oppress us. It'll be Lord. It'll be master because we've crowned it. It's the king. It's the same thing, we, same thing in relationships. Relationships are important. But if we make them the king, we'll destroy ourselves. doesn't matter what it is. It's possible. I think we're so fascinated by power, stories, even, even old stories that you know, come back around and they make a movie about it again. We just, we give it billions, not even millions of dollars. We give it billions of dollars because something in it about good triumphing or something, there's a hero. Think about it. The memory trace. The Bible says that before sin came into the world, it was perfect. And we had a perfect relationship with the king, the creator. A perfect relationship. It was how we were designed. And the world worked right. And our relationships with each other were right. And our relationship with God was right. And even our relationship with everything in creation was right. 
And we knew it. And it was like, yes, but sin. We decided we want to be our own saviors, our own lords. We want to be our own master. We want to be the king. And as those first people were thrown out of the garden, we lost that king. But the memory trace is we know the story when we see it. And in Genesis 3, there's this prophecy given. And even though evil has come into the world, that serpent, the story that Adam and Eve listened into that serpent and turned away, everything broke. But the prophecy is someone will come. And they're going to make it right. There's going to be a king that comes back and is going to have victory over evil. Someone's going to deal with the serpent. And he will suffer terribly. Genesis 3.15. But he will have victory. And I love this. There's the Bible's always talking about creation groaning. And it's like the leaves, the trees are rustling. And it wants to be back how it was created. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes, who is the king, who comes in the name of the Lord, who has come back. He's the true king. We're all looking for that, and, we, and I think we can't help it. We're crowning something, but it should be Jesus. Listen, the true king, he won't oppress you. He loves you. He won't oppress you because Jesus is a compassionate king. And we see that like in Luke 19. He sent two of his disciples saying, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it, bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? The Lord needs it. What's what's going on? I mean, that's, it's just weird. Like, why is he getting this little colt? It's, It's compassion. Jesus is fulfilling the prophecy in Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So Jesus is the true king, but he's also a compassionate king. He's not not going to oppress us, and he shows us here because he's saying, I'm the redeemer. They're thinking, king, take over, but Jesus has... Something else in mind. Jesus is the creator king. Can you imagine the disciples for a minute? Just thinking about this. Yes, it's finally here. And Jesus is going to ride in on the donkey. And the disciples are like, that's it. Right? What are, we, what are you communicating, Jesus? And he's like, I know exactly what I'm communicating. Right? I do not come with the power the world expects the Messiah to come in. It's different. It's different with Jesus. I'm coming with the kind of power that will actually change the world. It will actually heal the world. I'm not coming to bring judgment. I'm coming to bear the judgment. He has been telling them that all the way up. Three different times we read on the way to Jerusalem for two weeks. Jesus has been telling this. We're going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be handed over, flogged, killed. He said it to them three times. I'm come to go to the cross in weakness and suffering. But I came not to bring judgment, but to bear judgment. And they're missing the point. Because if Jesus came in now on a war horse, and he could. Could Jesus take over Jerusalem at this moment? Yes, of course he would. But what would happen? That people would be free for that period of time. But what about our sin? What about the true judgment in the world? So he's got a whole different reason because he's compassionate He's coming in to show what kind of king he is. He's not going to oppress us. When Jesus comes in, he's the redeemer king because he's going to die for us. He's the one king who truly can forgive. He's the one person, if you live for him, he forgives you. I love this. Jesus is the only king in the universe who can control us without destroying us. The last breath that Jesus breathed was for you. 
And the great and joyful paradox is that he makes us more of ourselves than ever before. It's not because that he's, he's, it's because he's our redeemer, because he's the one king who can really forgive us. And he's the one who's the creator. Hmm. We were created that way. Hmm. Think about the cult. It's never, I mean, it's very specifically says it's never been ridden on. Does anybody know anything? Here's, here's another cool thing, just for a good piece of information. Um, this is so cool. Does anybody know anything about riding on an animal for the first time? <laughs> they, they don't want that. <laughs> it freaks out. It always does. You have to kind of break it in. You have to work on it. And here we have Jesus... On the animal that's never been ridden and he rides in on it. And here, here's the miracle in this. Um, one commentator, uh, D.A. Carson, put it this way. And it's so awesome. In the midst, then, of an excited crowd, an unbroken young animal remains completely calm. Why? Because he's under the hands of the one who can calm the sea. Thus the event points to the peace of the consummated kingdom. Jesus, Jesus is communicating something. He's riding in as the king, but he's riding in in control. Listen, the wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. And the calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. They will neither harm nor destroy on my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We were made by the creator, and Jesus is just showing us he's got it. He's the maker. We can trust him. We need to, we can, like, beloved, we can trust this king. Let me just give you some. Him who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can ever pluck them out of my hand. I am persuaded that the good work that God began in you, he will bring it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor the things to come, nor height, nor debt, nor anything in all creation shall separate us from the love of God which is found in Christ Jesus. Listen to this in Hebrews 13. I will never, 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 never forsake you. Five times. I will never, 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 never forsake you. That's Jesus. The psalmist says, though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord receives me. His steadfast love endures forever. Those to whom Jesus loves, he loves till the end. Jesus is the true king. Jesus is the compassionate king. But the question for us this morning, is he your king? He's the only king that would die for you. How do we know if he's our king? How do you know? You want to know? This, this is yes. Yes or yes? Yes, yes, yes. Well, if he's our king, we have to worship him. We have to obey him. And we can even expect great things from him. So, or, or he's not king. We have to worship him. I mean, it's so obvious in this passage that worship is happening. What is it that we worship? I think it's the thing that we spend all of our time thinking or being excited about. There was a uh, Archbishop William Temple wrote years ago, your religion is what you do in your solitude. And what he this meant, when you don't have anything else to think about, and you're like, well, that never happens. But when you don't have anything else to think about, you're just kind of alone in your thought. What do your thoughts go to naturally? Just go to. That's probably the thing that we've crowned. That's the thing that's the king to us. But when we can see the beauty and the greatness of our king, 
and we learn how to pray and we learn how to meditate on him and we know how to sing his praises and let our imagination be captured by the true king, the compassionate king, King Jesus. Not believe in him in some abstract way, but actually to worship him. Is he wearing the crown in your life? Is he got it? We have to treat him like king. We have to worship him, but we have to obey him. And, and the disciples are. The, he, those he sent ahead went out, found it just as he told them. And while they were untying it, the owner said, why are you untying the colt? The Lord needs it. That's it. The Lord needs it. No explanation. Just a picture of obedience. Okay, the Lord needs it. He's got it. My daddy would tell me something to do, which was usually day, hourly. And <laughs> sometimes as a teenager, what would you say? You'd say, why? Why? And my daddy would say, because I said so. <laughs> now, could he have explained why he wanted me to do whatever? Yes, he could. But if I would only obey because I understood what he was telling me to do, that's not obedience. That's agreement. I haven't surrendered to authority at all because I need to understand. No, okay, you don't get that? Okay, let me say it again. Okay, when my father would say, Tony, well, he never said Tony, boy, I want you to do this. And then I would say, why? There, there's no explanation that is needed by the one that's in authority. Because... <laughs> Because if I was waiting for the answer for me to decide if I was going to do it or not, that's not obedience. That's, I've made an agreement with him. He's told me something to do. Now I understand why I'm doing it, so I'll do it. If Jesus tells us anything to do, whether we understand it or not, we, we, <laughs> you got it, right? We obey because he said it. Now, if we get to understand it, as we study, as we meditate on his word, as he enlightens us, as he speaks to our hearts, great. But whether we understand it or not, we have to be obedient. But Jonah, Jonah, God said to Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. And now, if we know anything about, they were the oppressors of the Hebrew people. Jonah is like, why would I go and preach to them? They're the ones trying to kill us. And so he runs away. So we get the whole book of Jonah. Um, <laughs> just because he didn't understand what God was doing, God told him, I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to preach this message. But just because we don't understand, he disobeyed, he ran away. If Jesus is going to be the king in our lives, it has to be unconditional. We just have to obey, whether it makes sense to us or not. If it's when we, I'll be obedient once I really understand, then we're just asking him to be a consultant. But here's another thing, and this is awesome. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, Jesus replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Guys, this is not Jesus exaggerating because the Bible tells us that when creation is restored, the trees will clap. They're going to be more alive than they are now. And that's what in us is going to happen too. When the king comes back, this is Romans 8. When the true king comes back to the broken world, everything is going to be made so right that it's, it's only a shadow now of what it will be. In Psalm 96 and Isaiah 55, the mountains and the hills will burst out into song. We can come to the king and we can expect 
amazing things. As a matter of fact, um, John Newton wrote that hymn and it goes like this. Coming to God in prayer, thou art coming to a king. Large petitions with thee bring, for his grace and power are such, none can ever ask too much. If we have low expectations, we're not treating Jesus as the king that he is. If we don't obey him unconditionally, we're not treating him as the king he is. If we're not letting his beauty capture us. And worshiping him, we're not treating him as a king. Matthew 11, come unto me all ye that are labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest because I am gentle and lowly in heart. Jesus is like, I love you and I want to give you all of that. But he's, I can't just be your shepherd. I can't just be your caregiver. I can't just be, unless I'm your king. Because that's who he is. Does that, that make sense? We can't, we can't come to Jesus and come to part of Jesus. We can't say, Jesus, I want you to be my advisor but not my king. Because he is the king. We can't come to him and say, I want you to be my savior but not my Lord. Because he is the Lord. Because he's both. And that's the reason why, by the way, they're so upset and they say, rebuke your disciples. Why do the Pharisees do that? Because Jesus was forcing everybody's hand. He was forcing everybody by coming out publicly and letting that happen. The whole whole Palm Sunday, just, just letting that happen. He's saying, you either king me or kill me. That's what he's saying. That's how we meet him. That's how he changes our life. Beloved, Jesus wore a crown of thorns. For us. They put a purple robe around the flogged, bloody body of Jesus and mock worshipped him. So we could be in his kingdom forever. He let them strike him. So we could live forever in his kingdom. And you know what? You know it's true. Because that memory trace is affirming that. Something about that we know. That Jesus died on the cross. To forgive our sins. And next week we get to celebrate that he rose from the dead in victory. And here's my question. Is Jesus king? Is Jesus the true king? Is Is Jesus the compassionate king? Yes, he is. Is Jesus your king? Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that on Palm Sunday we can see through worship. We can crown our true king. We can begin the healing process in our lives. We ask that you would help us to do what the crowd did, even though they weren't knowing what they were doing. Teach us how that we could praise your son as the king in our lives. Father, if there's someone here now, and that thought, and they don't know, they don't know, is Jesus my king? Ah, open it up. That they would be able to see him. And the crown of thorns that he wore, that they could live in his kingdom. Teach us that.